Neil was awesome. Um, what I thought first, firstly, Neil, Neil, I get to, I get to Neil. Oh, we've met in a meeting once, haven't we? In we Max have, yes. practice meeting, we have. I told yeah, you. We're in the Did you? Yeah. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. That's fine. <laughs> she never does. Never pay attention to her. <laughs> Not to me, at least. No. Well, it's easier. <laughs> well, yeah, lovely to meet you, Neil, again. Not in yeah, person. Yeah, lovely to see you again. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Um, happy to chat. Perfect. Thank you for your time. So Pleasure. Should we, should we knock straight in? Why Why not? Okay, so hello, I'm Sharon. And I am Agata. And welcome to Taming Your Inner Artist. We have got a guest with us today that we're actually, I'm quite excited me about too. it and so is Agatha um Neil Fox Dr Neil Fox associate professor Dr Neil Fox has has joined us today hi Neil how are you hello uh, thanks for having me uh, on your podcast yeah I'm doing all right thanks perfect uh, I'm, yeah I'm doing fine I think you should be because you're down in Falmouth aren't you and I've been seeing some lovely pictures from Falmouth recently I can't lie yeah. no I work so I worked at Falmouth for 10 years uh lived in Falmouth for a, at the start of that for a bit and then uh me and my wife Beth moved to a, a village called Stidians right uh, it's very nice um but then you know, we, we just moved back into Falmouth oh, which, very nice I've been seeing yeah. lots of lovely pictures of beaches and getting really <laughs> jealous hugely jealous yeah. really it's, nice. it, you know I, I could downplay it I wouldn't. Lie, but it, it's not. It's great. <laughs> I know it would all be complete <laughs> lies. I know. Exactly. I've seen. Exactly. I've seen the images. So, um, what we usually do, Neil, is we start off with a bit of a well, how did you get here, sort of thing. So, obviously, we're a practices research podcast, but can you just tell us like how how you've got to where you are? Because the amount of stuff you do it's quite <laughs> is, impressive. is a lot. <laughs> so, if you just give us an, an idea about how you got there. Sure. So, yeah, I, 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 came, I ended up in academia, as a lot of people do, sort of from a, a background of, you know, professional practice. So I'm from Luton, and when I, as I was doing my undergrad, kind of started making films with a friend I'd met at the college in Luton, and then we started a film festival in Luton, and then a company which kind of made films, and... Did sort of film education projects, and we also did theatre and comedy and yeah, all sort of live music promotion and DJing and just anything really. And then we ran an art space, so it's a very kind of independent-minded approach, you know. Like yeah. I, I, was, I would say, kind of an independent filmmaking background and independent film festival work, and that was my life for like for years. And then over that time, a lot of the projects we made in Included young people and people sort of mm. just out of education or just kind of interested in learning about filmmaking yeah. because we were the only people really doing it in Luton on a consistent basis. Yeah. So we would just bring people in. We'd bring graduates in from the university who would sort of turn up at our door being like, can we help out? And we ended up making films with students or mm. people who'd never made films before. Yeah. And just really loved way, making films in that way, you know, and running a film festival in the same way, really, with people who were just really keen, really excited, had no experience. And we just like kind of all just sort of learned how to do it all together. And that was just that was kind of the, the way the way we enjoyed working. Yeah. Then when the, the recession hit in sort of the late 2000s, all of the funding that we were kind of able to access for film education projects in the community and it just, just disappeared overnight mm. just literally you know and then we had one project which was about to go big the biggest one we've done and it just, it just kind of fell apart yeah. because the people who were giving us that support financially just didn't have that money anymore like councils education authorities just, just didn't have the money mm. so then it was like well what do i do now so i kind of just took the step to into teaching and I had a really interesting conversation with someone at the university and sort of said, you know, how do I get into teaching in the university? Um, and he sort of said, well, you'll probably need a doctorate. You know, that's the way it's going. You know, and I don't know if he was just trying to sell me on the doctorate program. <laughs> which probably was. Um, but I kind of was like, OK, well, you know, that sounds interesting. And I didn't really have a kind of transferable skill set that looked good on a CV at that time. It just looked like I'd spent 10 years doing loads of different things, which is exactly what I had been doing. Yeah. So. So I kind of started a doctor, a professional doctorate, 
and then just really enjoyed the research and then started teaching in, a, in an FE college while I was doing that and then got an opportunity to sort of apply down here in Falmouth through the course leader who I'd become friends with because another thing I did is sort of write film criticism and I met him as a film critic nice. um, and sort of become friends with him and he sort of runs the course here and yeah he sort of said I could apply for this job and that and, and then so then I ended up in, in Falmouth sort of 10 years ago and that was my first academic job um, and I've been here ever since so is that a, is that a that is a good that potted. Really that is a good potted history, and yeah. one of our, one of our favourite ones because it's it's that idea of um, <clears throat> there's so many different ways, and and academia isn't the be all and end all. I don't think any of us think that, but so many different pathways into practices, research, theory, research, how they join together, and 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 where mm. different people yeah. kind of come from, and it's something we've talked about with a few of our guests. Is just this sort of there's not this direct pathway. Yeah. And, and there's this no. sort of Wendy Road sort but of thing. But I think what's really interesting about you, Neil, is this uh, element of education, which was present in your mm. practice before you joined academia. And perhaps we can maybe follow up a little bit on that, yeah, because I find it really fascinating, because many people just make films or whatever practice they're engaged with. And they obviously go into academia, and this is when they start teaching. But it looks like uh, for you, education was there way before. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about that element? Yeah, the, and the reason I sort of mentioned, I think, because it, it did play a big factor in that sort of transition into academia and into my sort of practice research life, I suppose. Um, the the thing about it for me is that Luton is a place, you know, it, it has a reputation. Some of it deserves, some of it not deserved. But it it was a place where you could build a community of people to do stuff. You know, and that's what we did, really. But, yeah. but there was no infrastructure. You know, th there was no film culture before we built a festival there and started making films there. And I, I don't mean I don't say that grandiosely. It's just it's just that's the that's the, you know and that's yeah. that's yeah. the case yeah. really. So we didn't really have the system to do it any other way mm. other than that very independent like yeah come along. You know, it wasn't really teaching in terms of like what people might think of it. It was just we're going to make this film. We've got a bit more experience of you because we've kind of done one. Yeah. So we'll just share that with you. And then, but it became that kind of a form of education because, you know, people would come back, they would, their roles would change or, or they would then go out into industry. You know, you know, people who work yeah. as all sorts of things in the industry that, that came from Luton, um, you know, sort of professional editors, agents, you know, Amazing. directors. And they got their start by volunteering to make a film with us and, you know, we learned more, and then and then they, you know, they were more experienced next time. So then more people came yeah. in. So it kind of it's this peer learning thing, which I'm really sort of interested as well. Is this? Fascinating. But also, yeah, it's just it's just the independent thing of like, well, let's 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 make it. And then then it was like, well, these projects work really well. Let's try and sort of formalize that as a way of sort of earning a living. So then that became working, yeah, with summer schools or we built a kind of a film education consortium in Luton and Bedfordshire which had sort of partners which kind of funded projects and then we would get more funding to do other projects, but essentially the running of it. So we yeah. programmed a cinema and helped people mm -hmm. program community cinemas and, yeah, made these sort of amazing sort of kids' projects after school or, or in holidays or whatever. And then when I sort of started in Falmouth, I was like, why are we not... Why does this Why does this not happen here? Why do we not make films with our students? Yeah. Like, why do we not keep making films yeah. so that they get that experience of actually working on films with us? Like, yeah. a lot of it is like, well, you know, they don't have the experience. And I'm like, <laughs> so they get the experience by making it, yeah. you know, and we get to make stuff. You know, I think part of it was how do I keep making stuff in this environment? Mm, that's I mean, my that's, problem, that's yeah. a big a big thing isn't it to try and yeah. be yeah. able to on top of everything else maintain all the other stuff practice, yeah. maintain your practice and keep going i mean you've obviously got the now i'm not going to get the name right because agatha's not got it on the come on the computer for me to <laughs> sneakily look at but the lab that you've set up sound image cinema lab. sound image cinema lab um that that kind of perpetuates yeah. that working with students making films making some quite laudable films and i really mm -hmm. want to talk about um uh, the films that you've made because local cinema and 
that idea of independent local cinema is something I'm super interested in and I think is incredibly important for, for British cinema and, and also for these graduates that we're, you know, graduating and sending out into the world as well. You know, how did how did the lab kind of evolve and, and how is that kind of perpetuating that kind of practice education link that you've got going? Yeah, I mean, so, so when I arrived here, there was a little bit of sort of engagement with independent filmmaking in Cornwall in terms of, you know, sort of, putting a tiny pots of money in and having sort of placements and there was a kind of desire to to, you know, to support regional filmmaking and provide students with access you know the lab grew i think because and i, I, I hate talking about it like that, it sounds like i, I did it because i didn't do it like there is a team of people i think just raising questions like why aren't we making our own feature films and when people say what should we be doing as a department it's like we should be making our own feature films we yeah, should be amazing. funding them and the students should be working on them like that's it yeah you know so we've got staff who are filmmakers we know filmmakers in the region we bring them in we make something professional and we say we'll give you the money to make a film but you have to work with our students you know yeah. and the students on these projects that we funded are, are about 75 percent of the crew and often first and second years yeah that's um, amazing oh, that's really. the, and the reason for the first and second years i think is really important because one of the things i i, I think universities get wrong is that they focus placements for third years and end of third years so there's no potential for those third years to return into their studies and mm. show their learning. Yeah. So they don't contribute to the course, mm. their learning, and they don't contribute to their peers. So seeing first and second years come back after a professional experience changes the production culture in the school overnight because they become much Straight more away, aware of, yeah, of, that, yeah. of that practice. And then they teach, they teach each other. It becomes cultural. So it was, uh, that was it, really. And, uh, you know, part of it was that, again, I want to keep making films. I, I'm happy to work with people who don't have much experience. I enjoy it, but also I, I do want to keep making stuff. So kind of <laughs> pushing it forward in that sense. And then being really driven to make sure that what is always at the forefront of it all is pedagogy. So I'm aware of the desire of academics to make their work within the context of their job mm. you know and th there is a tension there in terms of i want to keep making work this is my job and my job is teaching the, the subject so i was like well if the way to make it is to bring students in then bring students in and a lot of filmmakers don't like working like that mm -hmm. you know, even though they teach students there's still mm. that kind of there's, there is a kind of perception that it's not a real film if yeah. it's got students on it it's kind of i think that's nonsense and what we've been able to prove over time is that our students are no different to graduates yeah you know no and you know they will be keen they will make mistakes but they will learn very quickly they'll be dedicated and that they will be an asset and what's happened is that those students have become assets over the course of their studies into graduation and now work usually with the people who come in to make films in this way mm. they have been retained because they just love working with these you know so as a very kind of academic aside in terms of the ref it went into an impact case study and one of the things that really hit the impact was behavioral change from industry who yeah. basically said yeah it changed our perception of what students and universities could do in terms of independent micro-budget filmmaking like over you know that it, that's happened we now will come to the university and partner with them and their students on professional feature films because it's great mm. <laughs> yeah, so it's it, but but again the pedagogy's got to got to drive it so it is teaching it is enhancement it is a core part of the culture of the school and an understanding that there are limits in what we can do in the classroom and what students mm. can learn in a classroom and if we can provide these opportunities to marry the theory and the practice yeah. of the classroom with mm -hmm. professional on set or post-production experience mm. and bring them back into the classroom afterwards we are doing something that which is which is sort of pedagogic and, and, and uh, is innovative in terms of those arrangements that's really great because this is absolutely fascinating what you're talking about and i, I like how you, you describe your previous experience outside of academia and now how you're bringing this into the academic context with the explanation of how theory practice pedagogy just come together is that the main difference for how you work with with young people making films uh, or is there anything else in terms of placing this practice within academic uh, academic context that make it somehow different if we were just to extract it uh, and the reason i'm asking is because obviously as Tyron said what we're trying to do with this podcast is to help people who are starting to to think about their practice in academic context so we kind of want to uh, identify those ingredients and in your, your case is particularly interesting here yeah i think that what i didn't realize i was good at when i came to academia was thinking about how to frame something you want to do in terms that are welcome to the people who are going to support it so what i mean by that is like you know when you go for funding you often have to think about how you can do what you want but also satisfy the criteria of yeah. x y and z fund and not just try and 
mold everything that you previously wanted to do into a form in order to just get the money to do it or just get the support to do it. So what I kind of realized I was quite good at was communicating the value of these projects in ways that would be beneficial and valuable to the institution in terms of things that they would care about. So student experience was number one. You know, the amount of students who would go through these projects and this was their experience and how that impacted their studies. So just, you know, talking to them a year after the project and say, what what did you take from this experience back into your studies? And then they just talk about it and it's mm-hmm. clear. And then you present that and say, here you go. These are the students. This is their experience. This is, you know, these are the, this is, these are the benefits of it. And then being able to say, well, we've made this film and this film should go into the ref, mm-hmm. even though it's a narrative film. Mm-hmm because narrative films don't generally go into the ref because the, the question that underpins it is harder to yeah. pass. Yeah. Um, the film is, the filmmaking is the research. So yeah. the film is yeah. the product of, mm. you know, and what we learned is in the films, in the result, but, but it's through process that, that the research happens and through the learning. And then of course, when you have students working on a film with industry professionals, there is a natural transfer of knowledge, yeah. so it goes into the KEF straight away. Knowledge exchange, huge amounts of students through this as knowledge exchange. And it's just learning, okay, well, how do I frame it so that there's there's no resi- there's no friction? And I don't think that's disingenuous because I think that one of the things of working with colleagues in a kind of research capacity is, is how much of it is confidence that what they're doing already has meaning and value. I think it's interesting about your podcast is thinking about starting that journey. Arguably, most of the people who think they're at the start are already on that journey mm. they just don't know how Great to articulate point. it yeah you know <laughs> they're, they're doing the work mm. and the work is meaningful and valuable they just don't know how to articulate it or they haven't worked out how to articulate it so that when they're communicating it to their research community to their line manager if they want research allocation time how to make that easier for themselves and i think a lot of that does come back from this idea of a, of a way to do things which is still seen as kind of separate from the academy um, as a kind of industrial practice whereas really you know any films we can make within the academy are going to be independent films which is much closer to the teaching we do it's much closer Mm. to the way we our students make work than this kind of idea of a of an industry that exists very at the very very top Mm. studio based i couldn't agree more you know so I think that's a, just a really interesting point that you're making about the idea of this is your practice and you, you but you're framing it in a way that people can then understand there is a research element in there and it's what's really interesting is that's not something I've thought about but you're right, like you're absolutely right it's when I see PhD students and stuff a lot of it is you, you're doing this thing but you yeah you don't quite know how to kind of communicate that you're doing this thing within yeah. the thing that you're making but it's really interesting that obviously you're bringing students through um this sort of practice uh, you know as research you're not hiding it because when we start talking about practices as a research thing with with students or other people there's a sort of a resistance and, a, and an idea of no i do, i want to make I, I make films it's like yeah but there's other stuff you can do with the making of the film and and part of what i'm really interested in in terms of the local filmmaking and what you were talking about as bringing in students on professional films funding them granted but on a professional film is that these films are you know really gaining traction and they're great like gaining attention and if we look towards bait and ennis man um the, the idea that they're, they're gaining actual visibility and traction that's super important because it's starting to kind of give possibly those students who are interested in that trajectory maybe that that idea that these things can connect and can make something that will land in a cinema and and be a uh, in inverted commas proper film you know that that idea of stuff that's in a festival stuff that's on a cinema screen and i mean how hard has that journey been how how is it an easy is it an easy and it's not an easy thing to do is it <laughs> we know that we can we can we can vouch for that but like that that journey are you seeing students kind of starting to kind of make that connection between practice and research just off the back of how interested and passionate you are about it that's a really good question. Um, it's a very long question. Yeah, but <laughs> to be honest with you, it's not something I've really, I've really thought about. But now I am thinking about it, and I'm thinking, oh, that'd be a really interesting thing to to look at. You know, I think that I think because it's taken so long to get into a position of the sort of critical mass yeah. around the, the films that we've made, and also the research that's coming out of it. You know, there's not up until the last sort of couple of years, there's not 
it's not been a huge amount of stuff to to to, to show and mm. i think that what's driven it is trying to get them to understand the filmmaking yeah that we value and are interested in mm. as filmmakers which is independent but also as you know in terms of cornish filmmaking yeah. the cornwall independent film community yeah. which is really vibrant and yeah so that's that's i don't i don't think i've actually thought about that um, i'm just i just yeah i just i, I really just talk thing. and really sometimes really good things happen yeah, yeah 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 no i'm interested in that now you know it would be <laughs> because because i think the trajectory is that that you know the trajectory is that they are retained in the industry here you know that they they stay and they make work and they think it's yeah as opposed to I think that one of the things that I do need to do in the next couple of years is kind of think about PhDs, and I've got a couple of, you know, like actually tying it to stuff. But that might, I'm wondering whether there there's a relationship or a, a, a research track for these students. I haven't really thought about, mm. but that's a really good. That's yeah. a really good. I mean, I think way that of thinking about it. I think there definitely is off the back of having that facility to create a, a sort of a scale that is, you know, somewhat beyond what maybe a PhD student might normally be involved in and that's that's no degradation of what they they do but that's, they're, they're obviously in a, a budgetary constraint and obviously having that access and, and kind of thinking about how that fits in no no absolutely i couldn't agree more with sharon and obviously i think it goes back to um, your point uh, from before when you said well for example in terms of research phds and things like that most people work with um, non-fiction really but i think uh, we i really want to see more and more people working with fiction films and yeah independent kind of cinema uh, but just, you know, made from A to Z, just made properly. And I think there's lots yeah. of potential over there. Obviously, I think what we're trying to discuss right now, which links again to the previous point when you were talking about your own research, is what this research question can be for someone doing a PhD in this. But again, there's lots of opportunities over there to think about the way of making the film, the way of, uh, of learning to make this film, the way to, to uh, putting the concept into practice. So that, I mean, again, uh, the, the whole variety of ways uh, to, to, to approach that. But, and I personally find it absolutely fascinating how you can almost get to another level of thinking of your filmmaking practice in fiction filmmaking context. So I think it's just really fascinating. I actually want to have a conversation with you. I want to invite you. This is an official invitation to my <laughs> seminar. I hope you, you She's you only say doing yes. it here, so you can't say no. So you cannot say no. <laughs> Uh, um, I would love to. I would but, love oh, to. thank you. I, ha I have a witness right now. I know. Well, you've got a lot of witnesses, <laughs> hopefully, at least, you know, <laughs> uh, two witnesses. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's really because uh, I think it's quite important what we're discussing here, because obviously we started from, you know, you doing this, fa you doing this fantastic job over 10 years or so with working with young people, then doing the same thing in academia, basically sharing your passion and knowledge as well with young people and just finding strategies how to teach that and making sure that people are successful, that the films are actually just really well received, mm. that it contributes to local um, filmmaking economy and industry. It almost feels like a natural uh, progression. It's just like, you know, to, to thinking how we can all think about mm. research for people who, who started in this way. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Really, I really enjoy this conversation. Yeah. This is really good. I think, you know, I think, thank you. Yeah, me too. It's, it's really interesting to think about. So I, lo I love conversations that help think through this stuff. I think I think that's really valuable. I really valuable these opportunities. So again, thanks for it's like a, an extended conversation through ev everyone, isn't it? It's like we we pitch this as you're starting out, but it's that idea of there's there's never a sort of a finishing point to it. There's always more stuff to think about and extend. Oh yeah, I mean yeah yeah yeah. That, uh, you know that we I, I just I just came from a meeting this morning where you know a meeting about the lab that we couldn't have had a couple of years ago. Yeah, mm. because the people working in what the lab was doing in terms of research and practice and practice as research you know because there are there are there are people who are making films here mm. that come out puts but there's also people who are researching pedagogy yeah. that's mm. tied to film pedagogy so you know but there's also people who are kind of doing both but that's a symbol of the growth of the last mm. and now it's like well what do we do next yeah you know, i was going yeah. to ask what's the years? future for the lab and you <laughs> <laughs> you kind of so do you have an idea of what's the future for the lab yeah. that you can share <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'd probably overshare um, <laughs> what, what what we want to do. But, you know, like Mark Jenkins' success has kind of shifted the, the scope of what we can do, mm. you know, in, 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 in so many ways. You know, it's kind of drawn huge attention to what we do. It's changed our potential to, to be a different kind of partner on films at that scale and has allowed us to engage with projects in a way that makes us more of a, you know, equity partner. You know, yeah, we can fantastic. we can we can say we can say to people, look, we can give you this. Before we would say we just want the pedagogy, but now we can say, well, it would really benefit mm. to be an equity partner, mm. so that 
the sustainability of the Amazing. lab in, in the long term through that return of investment. And because of Mark's success and because Mark's success has carried through all of the other films, really, and, and, and there's a huge, rich body of work, you know, people are on board. You know, they're like, yeah, you know, that this is exciting to do. So the future is is kind of interesting in terms of what, what we could do. And those, those conversations are just starting now. And the great thing is everyone has their own ideas and their own drive. So mm. before it was kind of responding to opportunities. Yeah that were coming up, you know, like, oh, let's get involved in this film or this filmmaker's got this thing or they've contacted us or this bit of money has popped up and we can use it in this way. Whereas now it's being a bit more like, okay, well, what do we want to, to do? And because it went as an impact case study before and will likely go forward again, that gives us a kind of, okay, what do we want the next five years, six years to look like mm. in terms of that? It gives us a kind of shape to work towards and hopefully relationships will deepen and opportunities will grow and there there are a couple of films that will come out in the next year which will move the lab into a different space one of which i'm very excited about and is, is already garnering amazing opportunities and again our investment yeah. in terms of the, the the support we provided was 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 so minimal but so crucial and the the impact of it could be could be really significant so yeah it's not that i can't say it's just that we don't really know, you know. <laughs> that's okay we're just having we're just having fun <laughs> thinking about okay well let's what, 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 what do we want it to be and institutional changes in terms of how research and knowledge exchange is measured or recorded yeah, of course, and, yeah. and supported post ref we had a very successful ref which we didn't in the, the previous round and a new new leadership yeah. means that you know that, that things are changing so it's a good time to be able to set down and say this is what it is and then of course there's you know individual aspirations within that you know in terms of, of what do i what do i want to do what kind of projects do i want to be involved in you know i haven't made a film in years i would mm -hmm. like to make one at some point i don't know when what's going to say off, be. off the back of that what do you want to do what projects do you want to be involved in i don't know i'd like to do something large scale that looks at which is practice research but yeah. the, the impact universities can have in changing the, the gaps in the industry that they report mm, on so what yeah. i mean by that is like mm -hmm. i love the research that has been done by people like shelly cobb around you know sort of gender disparity yep. and lack of you know and i love the work that clive and wonk has done about mm. race and i think universities have a great reputation deservedly so in terms of being able to highlight and report on yeah. industry practice and where it needs to sort of change culturally but i wonder what universities could do practically in that space yeah. by by how they engage with their own students mm. from those backgrounds and students or pre-university students in their communities to actually start to you know address it in terms of the skills and the talent that they're developing and i think that looking at long-standing sort of division in terms of film studies mm. and where it's located within university and film practice yeah. and where it's located kind of shows that, 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 that even now departments that report on that stuff don't necessarily make work that the, the making of films yeah. could be in a different department and how those that gap could could, could mm. be could be narrowed so that universities are contributing talent in different ways in the in the in, in the areas that they've already highlighted mm. as needing and just just to close on the one line in cornwall you know there are demographic issues particularly around class mm. and access that, yeah. that, 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 that we need addressing and that's something I'm passionate about from my time in Luton that I still am passionate about and I still see as, as, as something which needs addressing so that's that's something I'd, there's something I'd like to build mm. around that which would be a long a long project which mm. kind of which would involve films and making films yeah. that's all it would do yeah. Yeah. it would be yeah. I mean it's a big thing about something obviously we're like we don't hide the fact that we're at a university but we're, we're at Stoke which I think has a number of similar issues in terms of class, in terms of opportunity to, to somewhere like Cornwall. And it sounds weird because you think Cornwall, oh, beaches. But it's, it's, it's not. There's an endemic problem with employment and, and kind of seeing yourself to an extent getting out of and towards something else. But what you seem to be creating is something that, that says, actually, you can, you can do this thing that you've seen but you can actually stay you can stay here and mm. and do it and it's really positive it's, it's the class thing is something i'm deeply deeply interested in and quite i get like i'll use the word passionate but but it's it's i'm working class i have i have worked my way to whatever you would now call me sort of thing but very much that idea of being able to keep talent and keep people local 
who are mm. still doing things that are national and international, but they can see themselves still being part of their community. I think it's it's mm, it's, it's a massive really thing. Is. It's yeah. a huge thing. And I was about to say on the back of what you were saying before, you're already obviously doing this. It's like this uh, example of a yeah, PhD yeah. student who, <laughs> uh, or a researcher who's d trying to do something and they don't realize they're doing this. Obviously, you've been doing this for a long time right now, and you've just really nicely uh, described all these activities to us. So I think. Uh, you've already started this project, uh, this big project. You, <laughs> uh, you probably will uh, keep expanding, and I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to see uh, where it's going to take you because that sounds so positive. It really does. Yeah, mm. totally. Yeah. So we're Thanks. we're coming towards the end of our time in the studio. Um, so what we normally ask is, uh, given that we are kind of looking towards kind of encouraging people to sort of go, oh, I can do practices research, or I can move what I do uh, one way or another I always I always go it's from theory to practice or it's from making to thinking about research within mm -hmm. some kind of context can just what would your what would your advice be for someone who was like thinking about let's say wanting to start making film making actual output and and wanting to relate that to some research like what would what do you think really great sort of first dipping the toe in the water step might be Make something. Make something. <laughs> <laughs> I love well, that was it's easy. It's Thanks, Neil. <laughs> yeah. It's so flippant, isn't it? No, I think that um, I would suggest. I mean, you know, suggest. Um, I, I don't. I don't like. I don't like saying like I would suggest because I think that. Yeah, I, I don't want to be presumptive because I think one of the great things about practice research is that just the sheer the wealth of it and the breadth of it and the you know. Like, I, I guess it comes down to trying to find the confidence in yourself mm. that what you're doing has value and academia is a space where that confidence can be hard to find mm -hmm. based on people's ideas about it yeah you know based on their background based on it, it, and I say background in terms of yeah a working class mm. background yeah. or a practice background yeah. where mm -hmm. you know there is this idea of this kind of elitist space mm -hmm. and of and, and often the things that you then have to engage with have a very harsh you know acronym based <laughs> yes you know yeah. like so culture true. which which can be quite exclusionary yeah. you know and i think that so it's it's about having the confidence that you've ended up in academia because what you do is meaningful so don't throw it away mm -hmm. in search of trying to fit in but understand that moving towards it is necessary like you know, there's so much kind of resistance to like, oh, like you said about Agatha Redder, like, oh, but I'm a filmmaker and like I make, I make, I don't, oh. and it's like, yeah, but you're now, you're now a filmmaker in a different space, and it's mm. just a different space. You're still a filmmaker, your films are still valid, but but you might have to move towards, you know, and I, I think that one one of the skills that I think is most important is critical reflection. Yeah. You know, like you, most people do it anyway as filmmakers. If you've made more than one film, you've critically reflected in some form when you've made your next film and it's just a kind of uh, understanding that that is part of your practice and just not thinking it as an academic thing mm. or a theory thing but just thinking mm. actually this is and then using that to think about well how can I move towards this thing it sounds easier than it is <laughs> you know when it's sort of laid out that so I'm kind of wary of just being like oh just be critically reflective but I think that one of the things I really enjoyed about your podcast when I listened to it before coming on was like just you know, which is why I love podcasting, is, is, is the space to, to feel like everybody's working this stuff out together, you know? Like, no one out there has practice research nailed and understands what it is mm -hmm. and how it's going to work, but it's the process of doing it that is, is, is fun and rewarding and is of value. And if narrowing the gap for you as someone who teaches and practices and researches just seems like a smart thing to do that's how I, that's why i did it i was like how can i make my life easier mm. well if i teach the thing and i make the thing and i research about the thing headspace wise i can mm. stay you know and I, I you know i have moved away from that you know and a lot of a lot of the challenges i face personally and professionally have come from veering from that path but when i'm on that path of thinking about the resonances between them all it, I'm just I'm just in a better space. I'm, yeah. a, I'm able to I'm able to manage my job better. I'm able to think about my practice better, and I'm able to contextualize it as research mm. better. When I'm just like actually there is these linkages, and also the, the last thing I'll say is like pedagogic research is great mm. and has a reputation for yeah. not being proper research, but yeah. like 
it is very important. I'm you know, so glad. Wielding this as a job. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad exactly. to hear all these things coming from you because uh, I completely agree with you. Like, uh, first of all, this idea of you know balancing teaching, research, and practice puts you in a very comfortable place and it makes you feel well. Actually, I'm hitting all the elements which which come together in a very nice way uh, or could come in a nice way. And uh, the the kind of idea of well, we obviously made a whole uh, episode about uh, finding confidence, and it's just mm. so wonderful to hear it from you that sometimes people just don't realize how good they are or how much potential they have with some things and uh, really sometimes all you need is obviously th th they probably need to learn some skills that there's no yep. it, it goes without saying but just this little push a little gentle push and you can actually see something amazing and i think with the stories you shared with us today we, we could see how you managed to inspire so many young people to actually go into industry make really successful films be confident believe in what they do and i think it's really it really is beautiful it's just so so wonderful. And I've mentioned your podcast. We didn't talk about uh, your podcast uh, today, but obviously uh, you're a co-host and founder of a very successful podcast. And uh, perhaps you can just talk uh, very briefly about uh, what you do. And uh, perhaps you can also tell us, uh, give us a couple of uh, tips as um, uh, starting podcasters. To I was going to say, as you've been sitting there silently <laughs> judging <laughs> our abilities. <laughs> Uh, but it will, be, it will be great to hear about uh, the amazing uh, work you do with Dario, so if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, no, notes will follow. Perfectly. Thank you. Thank um, you. No. Um, again, it, it came out of a friendship with a colleague. You know, so Dario and I met when he was here at Falmouth, and we would watch films together, and we would talk about them, and we realized that we both like podcasting, we both listen to a lot of podcasts, and just it sort of naturally emerged as, as a thing, and we realized that even in a film school, there wasn't much space for watching films and talking about them. So <laughs> yeah. we thought we just, it sounds weird, but it's, it's weirdly it's true. Um, it's completely so, true, it is. So let's put on a screening and let's invite students and we'll talk about film together and then we'll put it out as a podcast. And that's, that's how it started, you know, and we thought that a few people, you know, we thought our network might listen and we hope students might listen, but obviously they don't. Um, <laughs> they don't listen to <laughs> film stuff, um, which is fine. Um, but again, like the, the, the desire to do it was just let's let's we wanted to do it yeah you know and then as it gained traction and sort of was picked up by a lot of different people and and sort of gained a, a following you know that 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 again that critical reflection of okay well what is it now yeah and I think we always had an idea that it could be research you know and then early on pretty much in the first year of doing it there was a special edition of the Journal of Media Practice as it was then it was called a disrupted the disrupted issue where they wanted to look at forms of academic publishing that yeah. were non-traditional yeah so we just said let's make a yeah. let's make an episode or let's do a podcast and that was really interesting called knowing sounds podcasting as a sort of academic practice yeah and that was that was when we were like actually we were able to spend the time thinking about how it could be research and yeah from in terms of my ref it went in as a portfolio yeah. um and again, thinking about where the research is located, which is largely in process and form, yeah. it's not in content. You know, it's it's about other stuff. And then yeah, it's just kind of grown, and it's 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 something that sort of sits there as a very enjoyable part of my <laughs> my academic life. But also, it's it's you know, it's it is separate. You know, it is. Yeah. And yeah, I think what what has been interesting in terms of like we've been doing it eight years now, uh, which sounds insane wow. when I say it out loud. <laughs> That's um, amazing. And all, you know, <laughs> uh, was being able to see the shift in podcasting yeah. and where it's going. And we wrote, we sort of edited a collection um, on academic podcast on podcasting, mm. and just to see those shifts and to you know to see where it is right now. And I was talking about this yesterday, which is that what I love about podcasting is that you can really build a community, mm. and what and that's not about numbers. That's about people who engage. Mm. you know mm -hmm. and get and get something really meaningful from it and i love the way it's attached to the internet in that sense you know because mm. yeah. there will be people around the world who will yeah. type out type in practice as research podcast they won't know about your podcast but they'll think is that mm. is there something there and they'll find you mm. and they'll get me you know and that's that's a wonderful thing that you know if you can find a way to to create a community that you know through podcasting mm. is, is you know and I think podcasting is now established enough that that will always be a factor of it. And what I love about it is that's like independent film. Mm. You know, regardless I was about to say what, that, yeah. You know, regardless of what the film industry is going to do at the elite level mm. in terms of streaming or cinemas or 
you know, the three studios that to rule them all, um, <laughs> people will still make films. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter what happens to podcasting in terms of these, you know, people at the top kind of, you know, monetizing yeah. everything and yeah. celebrities moving over from failed careers into <laughs> podcasting. You know, th- there will still be people who just, who love the mm. form, who understand its potential for meaningful interaction mm. and community. Mm. And they'll make it, and then and 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 and, and, and it's great. Yeah. So yeah, that's, keep going. That's awesome. really great. I mean, that's a really fantastic way also to wrap it up in terms of linking this back to, you know, talk about research um, disseminated in different formats. Because I do think, uh, you know, about film as a form of research. Of obviously, that's what our discussion was for the last hour. But there's so many other formats as well. There's so many so many other ways. We we obviously all write, but it's not about uh, all about writing only. And this is just really positive to kind of see how many options we have really. Mm. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. It was just Fab. really, really wonderful to talk to you, Neil. So I'll definitely be in touch about your invitation to the seminar. <laughs> Thank you and very much. Uh, so sneaky. It is. Yeah. So sneaky. Uh, but yeah, it was It was really genuinely This has been awesome, really. Neil. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of what I know is a really busy time because we're all drowning in loads of things as well. So thank you so much. Just really appreciate it. Really yeah, appreciate no, it. You know, I, I appreciate being asked. Um, and yeah, as I sort of alluded to before, if not fully stated, you know, like this is the stuff that we should be making time for is conversations with colleagues about what we do and, and about research and about teaching. Like it feels really meaningful to be able to do this. So I thank you for starting this podcast oh, and providing cool. that space because I think it's a really important space and I'm, I'm glad to have, glad to have been able to contribute to it. And I look forward to, yeah, other conversations that you have down the line with other people. Awesome. Wonderful. Thanks so thank much, Thank you so Neil. much, Neil. That's us. So I'm going to say goodbye from me. And goodbye from you. From Thanks me, so even. much. Oh, every time. Every Thank time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Neil.